You know, in our world, in the wealth care world, wealth care advisors who adopt our practice, you know, marry the goals-based plan with the goals-based financial solutions or the portfolio, and we implement trade and rebalance on the household level. It's in a sense a framework that our advisors follow. The reason that it's effective, you know, client service and it's effective client experience is that everybody's on the same page as far as what the expectations are. Welcome, Model FAs. I am very excited about our guest today, Matt Regan, who is the president of Wealthcare Capital, which is a technology-enabled RIA that provides advisors who are interested in maximizing the value of their practices on their platform, service, and technology that they need to succeed. So Matt's expertise ranges from client acquisition, client service, put together a cool software tool that's all about goals-based financial planning that we're going to be getting into today. So very excited to have Matt on our show. Matt, welcome. David, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking me on. Of course, of course. And I know we had a little scheduling snafu first time around with some construction on uh, my building. So I appreciate your patience with getting this back on the calendar. No worries. No worries. Awesome. So I guess just to get things started, tell us a little bit about your background. So you originally graduated from the University of Toronto. Did you go straight into financial services from there? Or what was kind of your journey from graduation up to this point? The answer is no, I didn't. I actually took a a somewhat circuitous path to finance. I started out uh, as a school teacher. I graduated with a a degree in history and got a master's degree in history. And then I ended up teaching in a special ed school for three years for children with learning disabilities and loved it. Unfortunately, just couldn't make ends meet. When it came time to get married and have kids, uh, we make it very difficult for teachers to uh, be able to afford that in this country. And I was forced into finance, but quickly found out that I really do love finance and wealth management. I started on the clearing side of the business. I worked for a clearing firm in Philadelphia, and I was actually in the securities lending world, which is kind of an esoteric part of broker-dealer land. And from there, I kind of caught the wave of all of uh, the banks and broker-dealers that were establishing online brokerage businesses. I'm so old that I was kind of at the outside of the online brokerage business. And we had a business helping banks put together their discount online brokerage channels. And from there, I flipped over and joined a guy named Bill Hambrecht, who started the industry's first online investment bank called W.R. Hambrecht and Company and worked there for 12 or 13 years running his brokerage business. We pioneered the use of an auction to bring companies public. So we brought companies like Google and Morningstar and interactive brokers public through the use of a online auction called Open IPO. And after that, I found my way to Vanguard as a consultant and helped them to build what ultimately became the broker dealer platform on which their robo advisor sits. I was a consultant out there for three years and worked with that great team on putting together really the foundations of their broker dealer platform. And then flipped over to the RIA business. I was the chief operating officer of a large RIA in Philadelphia called Westcott Financial. Great, great firm, great people, and was ultimately recruited into Wealthcare almost three years ago to run this business, which is a a really interesting, innovative financial technology play in the RIA space. So there's the whole shooting match. So I definitely have some follow-up questions to that. A couple just data points. So Wealthcare now... What are you guys managing? How many advisors are you currently serving? Give our audience a sense of the size of you guys. Yeah, so we are a platform solution for advisors seeking independence. We currently have 160 advisors. We manage nearly $4 billion in assets for those 160 advisors. And we have to be one of the faster growing RIAs out there. We've added a billion dollars of AUM in just the past 13 months. So We're very happy about the way our business is growing and that advisors are finding our solution to be a compelling one. Love it. So I want to get back to that growth because I've spoken with a number of advisors and firms, which is interesting because some of which have had their best year ever, right? Others are like, wow, that year was crappy, huh? (laughs) Right. And they're just on two totally different pages. So I want to get a sense as to what you guys did to experience that growth. I'd imagine there was some organic stuff as well as some additional advisors joining the firm with the consolidation that's happening in the industry. So I do want to hit on that. Don't let me forget, but I want to go back to your teaching days. So I would imagine as a teacher, 
right? And granted, you had some stuff in between, but in terms of like working within the personalities of advisors who may want to join your firm, working within the personalities of clients, I'm not sure how much time you're spending with actual retail clients now. What were some of the principles that you took from being a great teacher to what I would imagine was a, an audience that was challenging to be able to you know, get them to learn certain things and do some of the things that you were sharing because you mentioned, you know, special needs folks. How did you find that principles from that side of your life translated over into financial services? You know, when I think back, I was young. I was, you know, I got into a classroom probably quicker than most because I started at an independent school. So I didn't go through the whole, you know, licensing process and student teaching and all that. I was kind of thrown into it. And I was thrown into, you know, a very challenging part of the education world, which is special ed, particularly learning disabilities. And really the success that I had there was in kind of admitting that I didn't really know what I was doing and becoming a listener. I find that very similar to where I am today. I have never been a financial advisor. I've never had a retail book of business. I came up on the operations and the technology Mm -hmm. side of the world and I had some success there. But when I came into this business, it really kind of serve me well to listen to our advisors. I mean, these are the people that are providing, you know, they're really doing the Lord's work on behalf of their clients. I have the utmost respect for our advisors because I don't know that I could ever do what they do. And I think that's kind of, you know, helped me along the way is to admit that you don't know everything and really kind of soak up the knowledge that our advisors provide, because that's the only way we can provide them the services and the platform that's going to work for them. Ultimately, we want to grow as as a business but that's based upon our advisor's ability to grow. And organic growth in this industry is one of the big challenges that Mm -hmm. all advisors face. And we've cracked the code a little bit on that. Our advisors grow at three to four times the industry average because of the service offering that we give them. But look, I couldn't do that. You know, that doesn't have anything to do with me. That has to do with the advisors telling us that these are the services they'd like to, you know, have us uh, solve for them. There's a really good book Um, actually one of our prior guests that we had on the podcast, uh, Ivan Faber, it's called Conversations is his book. And he actually just, it was funny when I had him on the show, he had a book and I was like, Hey, just so you know, I'll skim through your book so I can ask relevant questions, but I don't really read books. I listen to them. So can you make me an audio book? So it just hit audible actually a couple of days ago. So he's got an audio book now. I mean, I've since finished it. And what you had said that really resonated with me that made me think of that was, doing a good job listening and asking great questions and whether it's for you or other advisors or anyone listening like that book is really really good not just from a philosophical you know you should be listening type of vibe or point of view but like giving you the tools and the tactics to do so because whether you're working with advisors or you're working with individual investors like they're all people right and if they feel like they're heard right? And that they feel like you're approaching them with exactly what they were asking for. There's no real selling that's going on. It's more so filling a particular need that you help them identify. So it's interesting that in the teaching world, as well as your role now working with advisors, it's kind of one and the same in terms of the skill set that you need from a human to human perspective. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, to kind of continue on that, I mean, I think it's always easier to be an effective listener when you admit that you're not the expert on something, right? I mean, it's really hard, you know, to take that mindset into a conversation and say, well, I already know all this, so I don't really, but I'm going to listen. You know, that doesn't work. You have to go in and say, you know, I admit that I'm not the expert on this and I'm here to learn. I mean, that works in a classroom incredibly, particularly a very diverse classroom where you have people with different, you know, skill levels and different aptitudes, but it absolutely works. And we do an advisor conference every year. It's the best thing for me that happens, (laughs) you know, because we get, you know, all of our advisors together and they tell me about their business. And, you know, that's, you know, hugely important in my learning curve. When I was early on in my career, because I spent seven years as an advisor before being a consultant, and based on like the training that I received and even the note, the 
some of the things that our management was mentioning to us of like, hey, just by going through this training, right, you already know more than 90% of people that you're going to meet with. And it kind of caused me to be very assumptive and kind of tell them what they should be doing as opposed to listening. And that's a skill set that just quite frankly, took me some time to develop and having change from just telling to doing a better job listening. I feel like relationships have gone better. Sales have increased right? The business has grown. But I think it's to your point, it's admitting that you don't know everything as well as just being a lot more patient because you can get a quick sale if you're being super salesy. But those people may leave because they're you know feeling pressured or they may back out you know early on because they just said yes to you and said no via email afterwards. And I found a lot of times people would say yes to me and then no afterwards, because they kind of just like felt pressured in that situation. Yeah. And I think, you know, across the industry, you know, if one thing has changed over the past, you know, X number of years, you fill in the blank, it's that advisors have come to the conclusion that, and this is, you know, look, Jack Bogle's got $7 trillion at Vanguard that says that you're not going to beat the market and just buy indexes, right? I mean, it's it's hard to argue with that. But advisors have been, you know, kind of come to the conclusion that the value that they provide isn't in talking about things like standard deviation and, you know, market returns. It's in, you know, holistic goals-based planning. And that's all about, you know, listening and admitting that you don't have the answers, you know clients don't want to hear that you have a better, you know, solve that you're the Warren Buffett of, you know, Westchester, Pennsylvania, and you're going to solve all their problems that way. That game has changed and advisors have come to realize that the value is in, you know, the holistic back and forth. And that's all about listening. So it's a nice segue. And then after this, I want to know more about the growth over the last 13 months. So I know you created a software tool for this to like help specifically with your advisors, but more kind of like 30,000 foot view. Tell me a little bit more about what goals-based financial planning means to you and how does that differ from other financial planning strategies or processes that advisors may be using today? Well, that kind of hits at the heart of wealth care. It, it, you know, absolutely predates my involvement with the company. So this company started in 1999 in Richmond by a guy named Dave Loper, who invented the industry's first goals-based financial planning software. He came up with the idea of goals-based financial planning software as an analog to what was typical, which was a cash flow model. And Dave really came to the realization that what really matters in a financial plan is not so much the top down, how are you going to spend what you have, but rather, you know, flipping it to, you know, kind of let's talk about what you want to do in life. You know, what do you want to achieve? How do you want to live? You know, how do you want your you know, legacy and your retirement and your family taken care of? And from that, this into what was known in the marketplace as finance, where Wells Fargo advisors know it as Envision. We call it GDX 360, the goals-driven experience. But goals-based planning, to me, is really much more of kind of coming right back to where we came from, or a conversational way to get at what's important. And really what clients want to know at the end of the day is essentially, you know, one question. And that's, am I going to make it? You know, am I going to be able to do the things that I want to do and live in retirement with enough, you know, means to get by? So that's the question that goals-based planning solves for. And there's a lot of math that goes into that and a lot of algorithms and Monte Carlo simulations and historical backtesting. And, you know, the power of goals-based Monte Carlo-based engine planning, it's actually a mathematical, you know, wizardry that far, you know, exceeds my pay grade. But the bottom line is, is you're answering that one kind of fundamental question, which is, you know, if these are the things that I want to do, and these are the assets that I have, and this is what's going to happen in the marketplace or likely going to happen in the marketplace, considering the worst possible scenario and the best possible scenario, what's the chances that I'm going to make it? And that's what our planning software solves. We're not the only one. Our competitors, you know, do the same thing. But that's really where Dave started and that's where the firm came from. Well, it's cool too that, you know, if other people are doing it and you guys are one of the pioneers of doing it, it shows that you were onto something, right? Because other people are adopting it, which is, uh, I think anytime you're replicated in some way, shape or form, it's a compliment, right? And yeah. at the end of the day, and we've talked about this before, which is, you know, having an abundant mind and open to collaboration and, you know, plenty of abundance to go around. It's, hey, if part of your mission as a firm is to serve clients and help them get to their goals, 
well, realistically, you can't serve the hundreds of millions of people in this country on your own. So if you develop something that can empower other folks to be innovative as well, it's just kind of further perpetuating that mission, which I think is pretty cool. No, I think that's right. That's right. And, you know, where the whole conversation gets interesting is you kind of flip the script on, you know, the client saying to the advisor, well, you know, my neighbor says that he owns the S&P and he was up 15% last year. Why am I only up, you know, 10%? Or, you know, I was talking to somebody at work and they have this stock picker that's doing great and he owns, you know, Tesla in his account and he's doing fantastic. The only way you take that out of the conversation is you say, you know, again, let's look at the plan. Are we on track or off track? Market performance is irrelevant. It's how you're doing with regards to the likelihood of you achieving the goals that matter to you and your plan. And if you're taking risk that you're not getting any reward that means anything for, you know, that can be best expressed by saying you're on track, you're doing well, you're going to make it. Gotcha. So last 13 months. So we're recording this right now on February 24th. You're probably listening to this here in the spring. So last 13 months or so have been a whirlwind of a year-ish with COVID and going virtual and you know things shutting down and things along those lines. And it's interesting because I spoke with a lot of advisors and a lot of firms, as I mentioned before, where some of which had their best year ever, other ones look back and you know, they're like, wow, that was the worst year ever. And I feel like figuratively, maybe literally, I don't know, that they've just been like hiding under their desk and like mm-hmm. waiting for this all to be done. And I think it's uh, anytime there's situations like this, it's a massive opportunity to innovate and level up. So you guys brought over just over a billion dollars in assets or so over the last 13 months. So you grew by what, you know, 33% mm-hmm. or so mm-hmm. in quote, one of the worst years in recent history. So what do you credit that to? Obviously advisors, right? Yeah. And working yeah. really hard, but I guess, and I don't need exact numbers per se, but just to like get a sense of the billion dollars, what came from advisors joining the firm? And then what came from advisors actually growing? It's about half and half on the, actually, okay. um, which is, I think that's, that's a coincidence, <laughs> yeah. you know, but you know, there's market appreciation in there. You know, if we learned anything in this crazy year, it's that the market, you know, doesn't have much to do with the economy. You know, it's been a very strange time to be in the wealth management industry during COVID because we're not really seeing the effects that I think the rest of our fellow, you know, countrymen are are seeing. You know, we're not trying to run a retail business or a restaurant or, you know, God forbid, uh, you know, a resort or a, you know, hospitality business. So things have been relatively good in our world, which it's a little disjointed, right? It kind of puts us in an odd space. But I think things have, you know, kind of been well set up for advisors, you know, particularly advisors that have been thinking about moving towards independence. You know, if we learned one thing working remotely, it's that, you know, it isn't that, you know, fine plush carpet, fancy office space and the grandfather clock, you know, in the wirehouse that's defining our value as advisors, because now they're all working from home, from home offices or basements or, you know, and they're providing great service to their clients. So the fact that, you know, the office and the trappings of the wirehouse were kind of stripped away quickly, forced advisors to look in the mirror and say, you know what, maybe I'm the really important part of this. It isn't the name on the business card. You know, at the same time, this is kind of a funny one, but it became a really easy time to deal with clients. You know, one of the challenges, and this is kind of mundane, that advisors have is getting in touch with their clients. You know, if they need paperwork signed or they need to find them or, you know, particularly if they're in the process of leaving somewhere, you know, you've got to get everything repapered and moved over. Well, advisors know right where their clients are. They're at home, just like they are. So it's been kind of easy to handle that part of the business. And I think lastly, why it's been a great year for advisors is, you know, advisors are trusted, you know, confidants and consigliers for their clients. And in times of stress, advisors really prove their value. And people, you know, maybe were considering a robo or considering, you know, moving advisors, all of a sudden are seeing the value, you know, in spades that advisors provide to them. So it's a little bit been, you know, our Super Bowl as far as that's concerned. If you want to talk about, you know, growth itself within wealth care, you know, we're a complete outsource solution for advisors. You know, we provide them, you know, financial planning and investment solution. We provide them compliance and operations and trading and marketing support and billing and all that sort of stuff. 
So if we're doing our job right, our advisors should be doing the important things to grow their practice, Mm -hmm. meeting with prospects, talking with clients, kissing babies, you know, growing their practice. That's the challenge for an independent advisor. And it's the challenge that we help them solve. So yes, our advisors have grown nicely during the pandemic, but that should be all the time if we're doing our job right. At the same time, you know, I continue to see you know, the movement towards independence throughout the industry. People are, you know, leaving wirehouses in droves. They continue to do that, which we consider to be a good thing. And their, you know, advisors are, you know, continuing to see that it's not just the investment portfolio that they need to outsource. You know, TAMPs have grown incredibly, but it's other things. It's other non-revenue generating activities that they need to get out of their lives. You know, they shouldn't be trading. They shouldn't be billing. They shouldn't be, you know, doing compliance hire somebody like us to do that for you. And that's the way you grow your practice. Gotcha. Hey, Model FAs, I know you're enjoying this conversation, but I wanted to take a quick break to talk to you about the Model FA Accelerator. This is a unique collaboration between us and you, where we help you build a financial advising practice that you can be proud of. We focus on the foundational concepts around how to pick a niche or a specialization, how to price your services, how to construct an offer that people are going to buy, and then how to market it and sell it in a way that'll get people to sign on the dotted line and become clients of your firm, all while giving you the information to scale and set up work and operational processes that will allow you to reclaim your time and build a practice that doesn't run you. So if you'd like to hear more about that, go to www.modelfa.com forward slash accelerator or www.modelfa.com. Hover over, work with us and click on accelerator. Hope to see you in the program. I was just on a call with my business partners, Pat and Dan Allison, who you know, and we were on a call with some of the folks over at DFA and we were asked, you know, how has, you know, COVID in the virtual world changed like the referral process? And there's some nuances that have changed, right? When people are, you know, out and about at dinner, which they're not at anymore, you know, you may come up in conversation. So it's empowering them to know how and when to bring you up when appropriate. But over the last 18 months, whether it's, you know, politics or the news or whatever, I feel like people's trust is at an all time low with a lot of different, like different types of people. And therefore what our belief is and what we've seen is now is the best time to ask for a referral. Because if I love my advisor and I have the utmost trust and you don't have trust in general, based on the last 18 months, I can pass my trust over to you and you're like thirsty for that trust because you may Mm -hmm. feel lost. So we found that the people who have like actually doubled down on getting introductions from their folks that they are currently serving, that's a lot of the reason why they've grown because those people are seeking someone that they can trust. And just by going out and looking on their own, it's just not as trustworthy as it used to be because they're getting sent so much random information that's conflicting in other aspects of their life. And so it's been a pretty unique 18 months as it relates to business development. A lot of times people think things have like changed a lot. And I think they've just like pivoted slightly, mm-hmm. right? Zoom calls versus mm-hmm. in person. But for all intents and purposes, the psychological side of growing your business with your clients and getting referrals hasn't really changed all that much. I love that. I'm going to steal that whole concept that you just laid out there. You don't have to steal it. I'm giving it to you. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, you boil it down, you know, it's very hard to look somebody in the eye that you trust that's telling you that this advisor is a good guy and does well. It's hard to look them in the eye and say that's fake news, right? I mean, that's what matters right now. Yeah, it's interesting. You brought up a couple of times now the migration from wirehouses, captives, you know, firms of that nature to the independent side of things. And obviously there's a lot of that migration as well as in the independent side, a lot of consolidation where people may go and, you know, start Joe Schmo Financial and get to a certain point and want to join a larger firm for the additional support so they can free up their time to only focus on the things that give them energy as opposed to things that distract them and, you know, inhibit their ability to grow. Why are you so passionate about independent versus some of the other channels that people can be a part of? Probably because I'm cynical about (laughs) Wall Street or, you know, I live, you know, we saw this in in 2008, right? All of a sudden it wasn't that cool to have, you know, Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs in your business card. And, you know, that doesn't mean that they're going out of business. They're doing just fine. And they've actually, you know, 
the wirehouses have actually kind of come around and said, hey, wealth management is a lot more predictable and profitable than, you know, being a vampire squid and trading against, you know, large organizations. But look, from where I sit, I think the idea of what's changed from a technology point of view, from the tools available to put the positive spin on it is that, you know, you can run your business very effectively as an independent with world-class investments, world-class technology tools, you know, incredible access to marketing support, you know, incredible, you know, ability to scale yourself if you're doing things correctly and do it on your own. That's what's changed. Now, the flip side of that, to be, you know, cynical, is that you don't need to be at a big wirehouse to get that anymore. And that therefore, they're really not providing you much in the way of the support that you need to provide what really matters, which is wise counsel and good advice to your clients. I don't know that I'm totally, you know, I'm not certainly not anti wirehouse. I mean, there's great people there too. But for those that are considering, you know, moving towards independence and embracing that and embracing fee only, you know, that to me is a better business model. And one that is, you know, eminently doable right now. It is. And I feel like once people go over to independence, they realize some of the restrictions that they just kind of, kind of got used to, specifically from a marketing standpoint, they come over to the independent space and they're like, oh, I can actually market my business like it's 2021, right? right. As opposed to, you know, the 1990s or 80s or whatever. Um, I also think that when they're going independent, They really need to look themselves in the mirror and ask, is me going out purely on my own and getting a higher payout? Like, let's say hypothetically, Mm -hmm. you know, they're going from like a 40 or 50% payout at a wirehouse, 30% to 50% even, you know, to a 90 something percent. Well, all the problems that the wirehouse was solving for them that they may not even realize, you know, from a compliance standpoint, a technology standpoint, et cetera. They now need to take that additional revenue that they have from a percentage standpoint and go and solve those problems themselves. And there's some folks out there that are very talented and can do that. There's other folks that I would say, you need to look yourself in the mirror and figure out where you derive energy, right? So like, what is your zone of genius compared to your, you know, zone of excellence, to zone of competence, to zone of incompetence, and anything you write in the bottom two quadrants your zone of competence and your zone of incompetence, you should not be dealing with those at all. So you need to find, you know, a partner like you or another, uh, you know, RIA in the industry who can address those problems. Otherwise, you're just going to be unhappy and you're going to get stuck in your business and therefore be unable to grow. So as you're going from, you know, a wirehouse, you know, BD captive, whatever, and going into the independent space, I don't want to say it's fairly simple. It's just like not easy and making mm-hmm. sure that, you know, you have the right team in place if you're not going to do it on your own so that you're not just getting bogged down with some of the stuff that you just got used to the wirehouse taking care of for you. Yeah. And I think the, the really interesting thing is that there's multiple models emerging, you know, mm-hmm. within the independent space. I mean, you can literally, you know, go find a, uh, you know, a solution that gets you a 98% payout and you get a, a desk and a compliance officer that doesn't pay very much attention if that's what you're looking for. Right. Or you can embrace a more full solution, a W-2 employee solution within a firm that has you know various tiers of service that you can take advantage of or not take advantage of and everywhere in between. So I think for the independent advisor, whether he's at that you know, that growth stall, which is always tough, that 50 to $70 million of AUM, where he's looking around and saying, God, I'm busy. What do I do next? Do I, do I have to hire somebody? Do I have to hire a compliance officer or a trader or God forbid, a portfolio manager? You know, whether you're in that area or whether you're, you know, creating that ensemble practice and saying, I want to build a big business here and I want it to be mine and be part of my legacy. And I want to hire advisors underneath me and put together a business. There's a solution out there for every one of those stories, which is awesome. Yeah. And there's a lot of consultants out there in the industry that can help, you know, with advisors and playing matchmaker. And to your point earlier on more of the client side, these consultants do more of like a goals-based approach, like what's an ideal scenario look for you and help educate them. Because I know coming from, I was at Northwestern for seven years and coming into the independent space from a consulting perspective, I was like, oh my God, there's 
so many things that I didn't even know about Mm -hmm. being there. So it can be an intimidating process. So making sure that you have someone, whether it be a mentor or consultant or someone to help with that process as you're going through the discovery uh, phase, I think is pretty important for these folks because they just don't know what they don't know. I agree. And then I think it continues, right? I mean, once you're there and you've established your practice and you've chosen, you know, which channel that you're in of independence, there's that next big piece. And that is how do you create true enterprise value in that practice? Mm. Because it doesn't matter which way you ended up independent. If everything is bespoke and every client's portfolio looks different, and your planning process is different and your account minimums are here and there and you're doing things differently, you know, for every different client, you're not creating anything that has real enterprise value. So where those consultants can help is to help you focus completely on, you got to create a framework, you got to create a methodology, you got to create, you know, some sort of formula that can scale yourself, scale your business, get out of the bespoke world. And that's kind of the next piece. Once you've chosen your your lane to go independent, the next piece is how do you create a practice with real value? And there's a lot of very smart people in the industry that can help out with that. Love it. So I know in our initial conversation before we booked the podcast, you seem fairly passionate about the importance of a great client service model. I'd like you to speak to that a little bit more, and then we'll transition over to your favorite book. So from a client service perspective, like what does that mean to you and your firm? Like what defines great client service? Well, I actually think it goes back to what I was just kind of talking through, which is, you know, the idea that you create something that is repeatable and relevant and scalable has a lot to do with that client experience. You know, in our world, in the wealth care world, wealth care advisors who adopt our practice, you know, marry the goals-based plan with the goals-based financial solutions or the portfolio, and we implement trade and rebalance on the household level. It's in a sense a framework that our advisors follow. The reason that it's effective you know, client service and it's effective client experience is that everybody's on the same page as far as what the expectations are. You know, I think a lot of times, you know, an advisor can get in a situation where they're looking at a client and the client's saying, okay, wait, is this what we said we were gonna do? you know, is this the way that we said it was going to happen? I don't know whether what you're telling me or what I'm seeing in my portfolio was consistent with where we started the conversation. Mm. I think that that creation of a formula and an approach centers people on what's important. In our world, it's answering that question, am I going to make it? And so that's kind of, to me, the client experience, I think, is dependent upon some sort of framework that you can establish for delivering your services. So I agree with that. I also think what advisors, where they can get hung up a lot is if they're working with a a bunch of different types of people, right? So for example, they work with business owners, right? They work with executives, right? They work with retirees. They work with widows, right? Whatever the niche is, I find that when they take more of a shotgun approach and try and serve everyone, what they find themselves doing is they continue to get more and more and more clients is they've made all these different promises on the front end and the business owner, their whole plan is different than a retiree and vice versa, right? Depending on their stage in life and, and what they're doing. So you're making all these promises on the front end. And if you don't have an exact uh, deliverable on what that service looks like from a what they're compensating you for standpoint and what the experience looks like, as it relates to how are you adding value outside of the scope of what you're helping them with, then they can start to get bogged down and their growth starts to level out because they find themselves stuck trying to do all the things that they promised on the front end without having the future in mind with, okay, how does this actually scale? So with that, I guess one of my questions would be, do your advisors tend to specialize with certain groups of people? Do they tend to be all over the place? What's kind of the vibe over there? The successful ones do, right? And there's two ways to kind of get at it, I think. One is, you know, as you say, pick a specialty and then go at that. We have advisors that focus specifically on women. And we have advisors that focus, you know, on business owners. And they do a great job. And they've grown nicely. And they know what their niche is. And it helps them to focus their marketing. It helps them to focus, you know, the, their planning approach. 
It helps to focus, you know, how they're talking to people about referrals. You know, that just makes it easier. And then the second piece of it, I think, is effectively segmenting those clients, right? You know, we've seen advisors more and more look at that, you know, that bottom of their book, that bottom 20% of their clients and make really smart decisions about how to either transition or change the way they service those clients. And that's important because you want to make sure that you're not spending time on, you know, clients that aren't as economical as the other ones that you have. Um, You want to focus on your most important and your most valuable relationships. That's all practice management. I mean, that's all, you know, who are you? What are you good at? And are you spending your time wisely and operating at the top of your license? You know, think about it as a dentist's office, right? You know, the dental hygienist is the person that, you know, does the teeth cleaning and does the flossing and handles that piece of it. And the dentist, who's the guy with all the knowledge, you know, kind of walks in at the end and says, okay, let's look at what's going on here. I'm going to take a look at, you know, the big issue here and make sure that you're okay. You know, that's what a good effective advisor does is operates at the top of his license. Agreed. And I think that it's important for advisors, especially I would imagine just based on industry standards that a lot of your advisors of the 160 are probably above 45, if not above 50 or so years old. So I think that's also presents a great opportunity from a succession planning standpoint to hire a lead advisor to, you know, bite their teeth on, so to speak, Mm -hmm. uh, that lower rung of client based on, you know, their AUM or income, whoever you're kind of judging them from that perspective, or I shouldn't say judging, I should say categorizing. And then it's, you're building a relationship with this advisor and they're building a relationship with your clients over a 10 year period or so to where it's just a much smoother transition, you know, when you're going about a succession plan like that, as opposed to maybe just like a straight up sale. So it's people I think should be thinking about succession planning at least I think 10 years in advance to groom that appropriate person, because you may even kiss some frogs along the way and not, you know, that first person may not be that long-term fit. So making sure that you're not waiting till the 11th hour to do that, I think could be very helpful for them. You know, it's probably the biggest challenge that our industry faces is that, you know, the, I think the FPA you know, came out with a study that said that less than 25% of advisors had succession plans in place. That's a shocking number for people that are supposed to be in the planning business, but it makes sense because people don't like to, you know, lose themselves in that relationship. And it's hard to, you know, let go. And, you know, there's a million reasons advisors are very busy. They don't get around to that. But I think what's encouraging is that the industry as a whole has kind of acknowledged that this is a big, big, you know, risk factor and custodians and platform companies like ours are coming up with solutions for these advisors, you know, whether it's, you know, some sort of pairing or whether it's assurance plans where there's, you know, there's agreements to buy practices. We're seeing some of that in the marketplace, you know, formalizing buy sell agreements. There's a lot going on to kind of address that. But, you know, at the risk of kind of, you know, flogging the dead pony, I think it goes back to you need to create a practice that has a standardized approach to it. Because if you're passing on something that's completely bespoke to whoever is succeeding you, you're handing off, you know, something that's going to slip through your hands like sand. You have to have something that has a formula, a framework, and approach, because that's the only way it'll continue to be effective for the person that's stepping into your shoes. 100%. So before we get into the after hours section, which I'm excited about, whatever questions you're thinking I'm going to ask, probably not them. So excited to see see some of your answers. But for our listeners out there, if this is your first episode that you're listening to, what I ask every single guest is what their favorite book is. I think a lot of times in our industry, advisors fit one of three categories, either they're complacent and they've stopped learning or they're hungry to learn, but they get stuck in just the industry related stuff. Or the third category, which I think is a small subset, is you're actually learning everything that you can, right, all over the place and putting your nose in books and your ears in podcasts and things like that. So every guest I ask what their favorite book is. And I am very interested, Matt, to hear what you liked about the book that you shared. Oftentimes, just by default, I get a lot of business book recommendations and and favorite books and your favorite book. I may need help with the author's name, but Midnight's Children, is it Salman Rushdie? Salman Rushdie, yeah. Rushdie. So from my understanding, this is a book that is about India's road to independence from the British. Um, It's kind of like the general theme, but curious to know, 
That's exactly right. So yeah, Rusty's one of my favorite authors. And I went down the fiction path. I'm not a big reader of business literature. I should be. That's my own flaw. Well, if you go I back the- and listen to some of our episodes, there's plenty of recommendations. On yeah. Well, you know, I do, I've been spending a lot of time listening to podcasts. So I think that picks up some of it. Right. But, I, you know, but my reading is mainly fiction. And Rusty captures a couple of things for me. As I had mentioned, I'm, I'm a historian by training. I have a master's degree in history and an undergrad degree in history. And Rusty's work is you know, always very historical based. So this is the story of the partition of India back in 1947, you know, but it's told, as you said, through kind of this magical, you know, mysterious parable. And that's very characteristic of Rusty's work as well. So I do like kind of the fantastic, but I also love the fact that it's grounded in history. It's a fantastic book. And, you know, it's one that you need to find time to kind of clear your head to read. You know, we're so darn busy in our our day to day when I do find the time to read, it's usually fiction that I pick up. That probably goes back to my days as a school teacher. It's very enjoyable for me. Well, it kind of probably allows you to, you know, unplug a little bit too, as opposed to like making your brain go and go and go with a business book. And then you're like, oh, I have an idea. And I got to go back to my desk and start working on that. So I feel like, and there's been a couple uh, fiction book recommendations with our guests so far. And I think it's helpful for me as well, because I'm on the other side where it's like, all business, all marketing, all personal development. And I feel like oftentimes, like my brain just like needs a break for a little bit. And I think these types of books could still be, what's the word I'm looking for? Stimulating my mind, but not necessarily making me want to like take action immediately. So where I can't like turn off. So I'll have to check that out. Right. Yeah, I, I would encourage you to do that. I think sometimes we need to unplug and get that other side of our brain engaged. Cool. So Matt, before we get into the after hour section, and for those of you who want to stick around for that, please do. This will all be in the show notes as well. But Matt, if someone's interested in touching base with you, either as a follow-up to this show or to learn more about what you have going on, what's the best way to get in touch with you guys? WealthCareGDX.com is the corporate website. My contact information is on there. Mregan at WealthCareCapital.com is the email handle. But yeah, I would encourage people to visit our website and find out more about our solution. Awesome. Uh, Well, thank you very much for being on the show. And for those of you who are listening to Ask For You, if you found value in today's show, we'd love for you to share this with a colleague that you think would find it interesting as well. Um, Continue to share some exposure as to what we're doing and help out those around you as well. Also, what would be really helpful for us is if you went ahead and left a review on iTunes, that will create some more visibility for us. So we'd appreciate you doing that as well. And if you do decide to do that, feel free to take a screenshot of that and then shoot me a text at 978-228-2338. Again, 978-228-2338. And just reference this episode with Matt and I'll collect all those reviews. Basically put your name in the hat and we'll give you access to our digital program that we have, the accelerator program that you can take a look at on our website as a thank you for, you know, going out of your way and saying some nice things about us, hopefully anyways. So appreciate everyone's time. We're going to be heading into the after hours now. Matt, appreciate the time so far. David, thanks so much. Awesome. Cool. That was fun, man. I think uh, I really, really liked to hear about the growth that you had in what a lot of people view as a tumultuous year, uh, which, you know, in everyone's situation is different, of course, and it could have been more impactful for them um, than others. But I also feel like our industry, based on like the revenue models and how we get compensated, it can create complacency. Yeah. And a lot of people just kind of stopped because, I mean, after the initial downturn, you know, in March or so, when it bounced back up, it's like, okay, well, things are hitting the fan right now, but I'm still getting my quarterly, my quarterly check. So I'm glad to hear that you guys actually like maximize the opportunity as opposed to just chilled. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't want to cast aspersions at that mindset too, because, you know, I think we tend to underestimate how difficult it's been for people. I mean, you know, isolation and kind of the uncertainty. I certainly don't 
fault people for kind of freezing in their tracks and saying, holy smokes, what in the world's going to happen going forward? Now, what happened in our industry is that, you know, the market kind of pulled us along and pulled us up. But it, there is a sense of, you know, kind of unreality around it because, you know, why did the market continue to plow on when, you know, so many people were in such dire straits? But that's the disconnect. And there's a little bit of a jarring, you know, piece of that for, I think, for people. So I don't, again, I don't blame people who got stuck mid-year and said, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to see what happens. Well, I think too, and I wouldn't say that like I blame them either, but I think that in times like this, people need to become resourceful. So if they find that their mind isn't right, right, for example, you know, maybe they should look into hiring a coach, right? Or a therapist even, depending on how severe it is, or, you know, if they're unmotivated to do certain activities in their business, it's okay. It's a time to be resourceful to figure out, okay, who can help with that stuff? So I think that of the ones who felt kind of stuck, you know, and if you're still listening and you're one of these people, my biggest piece of advice would just be, don't be afraid to ask for help with whatever it is that you're struggling with. Um, So, but all in all, very impressed with the growth that you had in a crazy year. Let's get to some fun questions. Sure. So these are a bunch of would you rathers. I'm not sure if you ever come across would you rather questions, but you're yeah, gonna be- I do, do it with my daughter all the time, right? Oh, so, great. Right. Can't have wait your, for you to tell her. Have right your ear cut off or, you know. Yep, perfect. <laughs> so would you rather lose the ability to cry altogether or cry every day for 20 minutes randomly? And these are tears of joy and wow. of sadness. And I think crying feels good if under the right circumstances. I do, but <laughs> I'm not a big crier. So I think I would actually find a way to live without it. Awesome. Would you rather have a face that everyone laughs at or a name that everyone laughs at? A name. I actually wish I had a funnier name. You have a very basic straight. It's so name. yeah, it's so boring. <laughs> but wouldn't it be it would be great if you know you were if your name was like, you know, Mickey O'Donuts or something like that, and people would be like, Really? It's a great conversation starter. What about a hook for a hand or a peg for a leg? Hook for a hand. Hook for a hand. That's a conversation. No explanation. Just yeah. like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the last one would be, would you rather have the ability to read the minds of everyone in the world or be able to move objects with your mind? Oh, read the mind. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a dangerously powerful. Yeah. Like, I mean, it would right be. hands, you can do good and. So it would end up being disturbing after a pretty short period of time. But yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, for everyone who's stuck around for the after hours portion, really appreciate your time. We're probably uh, about an hour or so into the podcast now. So that does not go unnoticed. So thank you so much for that. If you do have any questions for us, feel free to reach out to me directly. My email is david at modelfa.com. And also feel free to connect with me on the social platforms as well. Simply Google David DeSell, D-E-C-E-L-L-E, and you'll see all the links to my social profile on that search. The platform that I use the most, which is the most fun as well, because we get to know each other personally, is Instagram. So feel free to connect with me on there and always happy to have a conversation. So don't hesitate to reach out and all of Matt's contact information will be in the show notes as well. Matt, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. Have a great day.